Stillwater's Morning Scramble, glad to have you here, and always enjoy this Thursday when Stillwater Neurology is in, Dr. Wedlake and Amy and Ashley are in today, and uh, we were talking about the debate, uh, we didn't go into specifics or anything, we were just kind of uh, talking about, uh, well you were talking about, <laughs> kind of say you fell asleep. Yeah, I, I did, I fell asleep right in the middle of it. Um, it's but, been a long couple of days, so. But what I wanted to do was, uh, when you are kind of in the political world, you watch those, I would imagine, differently than, than the average person because you understand they don't enter those things without strategy. They prepare a lot beforehand. Right. Yeah. And you know, uh, when I was going through my election, my reelection uh, bid here in Stillwater, you know, we did a couple of debates. Um, and I am not a I am not a seasoned debater. Um, I think anybody mm. that watched those debates could tell you that um, it's 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 nerve wracking. Um, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it because you don't know what questions are going to be thrown at you. So you have to have a you have to have a wide uh, knowledge base um, in order to sound intelligible on whatever question they're going to ask you on uh, about whatever subject. So uh, there's a lot of, of preparation that went into them for me. And, and watching them, you know, you can tell you can certainly tell the people that have been uh, versed in the in the art of debate and those that haven't. Um, and I think they both did actually a, a, an admirable job last night in terms of debate skill. Um, you know, I, I thought that it was very respectful. It was well, well uh, above and beyond the debate last week, uh, which I thought was, was a little embarrassing. Um, I thought the debate last night was respectful. I thought they both did a, did a good job in, in getting some, uh, some important points across. You know, uh, there are a couple of things that I noticed, that, and I think these are things that people do, whichever party or, or whichever candidate, hopefully you're watching the candidates, um, but, the, but I think there are a couple of things that jump off, and in watching responses, I think uh, uh, two things really annoy people. One, when they go over, when you're told to stop mm -hmm. and, you, and you refuse to stop, because mm -hmm. it does show that, okay, you don't follow rules. Yeah. And two, when a question is asked, and they basically divert it and go, no, that's not the question I want. I want to go back and talk about something else. Right. Yeah. And and so I think whichever side you're on, and that happened more on one side than another last night, where sure. it was sort of, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to talk about something completely different. Yeah. Uh, but people do notice that. And I saw Susan Page, who's the moderator of that debate on TV today, and you know she handled it a little different. She's not really a broadcaster. She she writes for the USA Today, mm -hmm. and so she said that's not really what I do. So I asked the questions, and so. But she thought letting, uh, letting those things take place gives you a window into to the candidate a little bit. Sure. You see their personality. If they are answering a totally different question, shows you a little bit, okay, they're for some reason avoiding this. Mm -hmm. and, you, you're, and the audience gets to decide why. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I'll, I'll, just, you know, I'll just say it, but Mike Pence did a lot more uh, deflecting, I think, last night in terms of not answering direct questions that were asked him. I think, again, I think he did a good job in, in covering the points that, that were covered. Uh, but you're right. When somebody, when somebody goes over on time, doesn't follow the rules, and it's, and it's kind of one-sided that does that, it's something that's noticed. I mean, you don't, you don't just say, oh, well, that's perfectly normal. I mean, your campaign agreed to the rules prior to the debate. Right. Um, adhere to the rules and 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 let's let's have a respectful discussion here. Um, so I, yeah, that was that was a little off putting, uh, just being from me personally. Uh, but again, you know, when it's it may be a sign of twenty twenty. Uh, yes. but the, but when you look at that and say, well, that was actually really really uh, toned down and respectful uh, because our <laughs> our barometer on that was of course the presidential debate last week, which was. Uh, I would argue not really a debate at all. You know, when they had, and one of the uh, things that it was, it turned out to be a, a bit of a spreader, it looks like, was their debate prep team. I'm Chris Christie was involved in that. Mm -hmm. He's in the hospital now. Right. And I was shocked to realize they had a debate prep team mm -hmm. last week. Well, and again, it's it's certainly a presidential or vice presidential debate different than a Now, this one you could tell they did because yeah. they were totally yeah. prepared. Um, than a debate for a... Stillwater City Council seat, but when I was when I was going through a re-election bid, um, there was a lot of prep time. In fact, a lot more than I would have even thought. Uh, getting up there when we did our uh, League of Stillwater League of Women Voters um, uh, forum, uh, I there were hours that I put into that uh, to I'll try bet. and you know make sure I had all my facts straight in terms of of numbers on you know uh, TIFs, uh, tax increment financing, and, and make sure that all of my facts were straight because to memorize all that, I mean, that takes, 
I mean, I am 40 yeah. now, so I don't memorize things as well as I used to, but um, I wish there was a neurologist around I could talk to. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. Well, you have two great... Great folks in here that that's, can help. And, 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 and that, therein lies the real rub, is that uh, I'm hiring more so that uh, I can be taken care of. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the prep time that goes into that was, was more than I gave it. And just can, can you mention the nurse? Because they only were having one debate. Yeah. Although I did hear somebody say this morning, I thought that's probably interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we see those two candidates again. Not necessarily for this. Right. We won't see them again now, but right. they both have presidential aspirations. Mm -hmm. And so that may be something we see again in four years. Yeah. You know, and, and for different reasons on both sides, you know, I'm, I'm fairly, uh, I, I've said this publicly before, I'm fairly moderate, uh, middle of the road. I like to weigh a lot of, of, of different things and different issues. So I, don't, I certainly don't vote party lines. Uh, but I would be okay with that uh, on both sides for different reasons. Uh, I like some of the things about Mike Pence. I like some things about Kamala Harris. And there are things that I don't like uh, about or disagree with on both candidates. But if both both of those candidates were in that debate last night for a presidential bid, I'd be okay with that. We'll be talking about that in a few years, probably. Yeah, I bet you're right. And we'll have the, the same great group in here. So there you go. Hey, let's, let's continue talking about or go back to where we were talking about. We were talking about Alzheimer's, and we wanted to kind of follow up on that and with treatments and follow-ups and yep. where we are and, and handling these situations. Yeah. Right. So when um, our patients come in complaining of memory changes, um, there's a couple of or four different tests, actually, that we uh, start with. Um, one of those being we get some lab work to rule out any deficiencies in vitamins or other uh, immune mod conditions that can be going on. Um, uh, the second test would be a neuropsych testing, which is where they come into our office and we do some testing online um, to test different skills. Those take about two hours or so. Um, and then we do a, the third test we do is an EEG, which is kind of like an EKG of your heart, except it's on your brain. So we hook you up to a monitor and watch your brain waves and see how they are reacting. Um, and the fourth part is we do some imaging of your brain to check for structural changes that have occurred. Okay. Can you tell strokes and stuff with that? With, with that? I know we're talking about something with, different, but with the, with the EEG? Um, so you can, um, it's certainly not the, the primary gold standard okay. of, of stroke diagnosis, but if strokes are large enough, you can see what's called focal slowing on an EEG, um, that can clue you into there, that there's some kind of structural lesion there, whether it be a stroke, whether it be a, a tumor, uh, whatever, uh, whatever the structural lesion may be, but you can see that on an EEG. I guess I asked that because, uh, and you know, I've talked about, we've talked about strokes several times on here. And you you learn afterwards, is it, and, and they'll tell you as it turned out he had a mild stroke or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like I wondered how did they how could they tell that? Yeah, or, if you're for stroke specifically, your your modality of choice is going to be imaging. And 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 in the world of imaging, MRI magnetic resonance imaging uh, is is the gold standard there. So, um, but when we're but when we're looking at when we're getting imaging for the workup of somebody with memory complaints or somebody that might have dementia or specifically Alzheimer's disease, uh, what we're looking for there um, is not so much strokes, but uh, changes that occur in the brain um, as uh, the disease process continues. Uh, Alzheimer's is an example. Patients get smaller temporal lobes, um, preferentially first. So their anterior temporal lobes or the front of the temporal lobes uh, tend to get smaller over time in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And then as the, the disease progresses, uh, you start getting involvement of the frontal lobe. So uh, there are specific changes that occur in the brain that we look for um, on imaging in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And age-wise, the most common to, st to start seeing this is what, 60s? So there's a, there's a distinction between early onset and late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, the cutoff age for that is 65. So if you start showing signs of the disease before 65, by definition, it's early onset okay. Alzheimer's disease and, and vice versa for late onset. Um, late onset overwhelmingly is the most common form. Um, early onset Alzheimer's disease are usually familial forms or genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, patients with APOE4 mutations, for example, we see this in. Um, but usually when we say Alzheimer's disease, it's kind of implied that it's late onset or after the age of 65. And when we talk about those numbers, would you say four and a half million? Four and a half million right now. Four and a half million. In the United States. The majority would be over 65. Over right? 65, yes. Overwhelmingly the majority. In fact, over 90% over of those patients are over the age of 65. And we're advancing with treatment, right? 
So that's a, always the hot button question, right? Is what, how close are we to a cure? You heard the optimism in my question. Right, right. right. So, you know, Alzheimer's disease is one of those things that, uh, one of those diseases we don't have a cure for. And that's something that, that is known by, by a majority of the population. It is incorrect to say that there is no treatment available for Alzheimer's disease, however. We do have treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they can, in a subset of patients, be quite effective at delaying progression of disease. Now, on the cure front, we're not making a lot of headway. Um, I hate to squatch your optimism there, Steve, but um, there was a recent uh, molecule, in fact, last year, a uh, new molecule that was targeting beta amyloid, which is a protein that builds up in the brain in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this, this drug was aimed at basically stopping the formation of a beta pleat of this of this protein. Uh, the quick way to say that is, is lower the amount of this protein, and the hypothesis was that you could cure or stop Alzheimer's uh, uh, formation. That tended not to be the case, and in fact, every single trial that has looked at amyloid as a target has failed, every single one of them. Uh, this one failed, and it was finally, the R&D on that was stopped last year. Um, there's a couple of drugs in trial right now, one being done by the University of Pennsylvania that's maybe showing some promise. It's another uh, beta amyloid target. Um, it's hard for me to get optimistic about this because, again, the history is, is that amyloid target medications have not worked. Um, so we'll see. There are, there are certainly um, uh, trials ongoing, um, but with the world being what it is right now, uh, the yeah. way I foresee this happening is, is that a lot of R&D dollars, NIH dollars, are going to COVID research right now, which kind of dries up those research dollars for other disease states, Alzheimer's included. So, you know, I... I you know, I that's one of those sites we don't even think about, or, or, or most of us, the fact that we want the vaccine, we want, we want COVID to, to make all the progress, but what are we sacrificing as we go along? Sure. There's always, there's always a pull. There's a push and a pull, yeah. right? And the pull is that, that we don't have an endless amount of, of money. Right. We don't have an endless amount of research dollars. And so um, our research in other disease states right now is, is taking a little bit of a hit while we're trying to figure out this whole COVID thing. Now, again, that'll equilibrate once we do figure this out. Um, I do believe that we'll get an effective vaccine and that once we get our population vaccinated, things will get more normalized than they are right now anyway. Well, what, about, um, what about mental exercises? We, we hear about that. Uh, and, you know, I think most of us, if we if we quit doing what we're doing for a little while, when you come back after we talk about a vacation mm -hmm. or whatever, you're rusty. And, you, you know, yeah. it takes a while to get to get everything going again. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think that's basically magnified so much when it comes to something like this. But keeping your mind working at all times is important, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and even more to the point, doing uh, getting into a good routine. Right. You, doing doing the same things. Uh, around the same time on a daily basis is something that can help solidify those, those pathways in the brain, use them more efficiently. Um, a lot of times people ask me about um, uh, online games, uh, things yeah. like Lumosity, you see uh, advertised a lot. And really the research will tell you that, that doing those games makes you good at those games. Um, it yeah. doesn't really help functional outcomes in terms of being able to remember to pay your bills or, you know, keep your math skills or that kind of thing. Well, you hear but that about, uh, not as high tech, but even crossword puzzles and stuff like that, you'd hear that discussed. Right, and those those tend to make you good at crossword, crossword puzzles. Puzzle. Okay. Um, it does, that, that skill does not generally translate into other functional aspects of life. But there are things that you can do, things like uh, eating low-fat diets. Um, in fact, the Mediterranean diet has been shown in some trials to be beneficial or protective um, against uh, progression of Alzheimer's symptoms. Um, it has recently come to light that aggressive blood pressure control as a cardiovascular risk factor, that management is important uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And those that have aggressive blood pressure management tend to do better um, in functional scores than those that don't have aggressive blood pressure. And by aggressive, I mean 120 over 80. You ready to take a phone call here? Sure. If somebody has a question about this. You're yeah. on with Dr. Wedlake. Good morning on the Morning Scramble. Hi. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Wedlake. Good I, morning. Uh, I, uh, I I'm enjoying the conversation. I do have a family member that's uh, involved with dementia, but I a question. I don't mean to change the subject, but how? What are the? Uh, are you seeing an increase in any ALS patients? 
that's coming through uh, at this time. And uh, if so, uh, what's the latest you've heard as far as finding a cure? So on ALS specifically, um, we have, I have not seen an increase in incidence of ALS in the last couple of years. Um, in terms of uh, treatments and cures for ALS, um, there has been, in the last eight years, um, there has been a new drug on the market um, called Reticava um, that is a different mechanism of action than the previous drug that, that was the only medication on the market called Rilazole uh, for the treatment of ALS. So Rilazole, to give you a little bit of history, and I think, is this JM? Yeah. Yep. Hey, James, how you doing, man? Just fine. Good. Um, the uh, Rilazole medication w had been on the market for, for decades um, and really was not, um, you know, of course, it depends on your on your definitions of effective, but... Uh, was not the most effective treatment for patients with ALS. In fact, Rilazole extended life expectancy by 90 days. Uh, 90 yeah. days in the clinical trials was what um, Rilazole did. Now, in some some patients, you say uh, would tell you, "Hey, three months. That's 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 what I want. I want three months uh, of my life extended." And and that's what Rilazole was there for. Some patients would say, "I don't want to. I don't want to have my life extended that way." And so Rilazole was not appropriate for them. So Radicava hit the market of eight or nine years ago now. Um, and honestly, doesn't extend much beyond what Rilazole did. But the side effect profile of, of, of Radicava is, is kind of preferred to Rilazole. Um, but those are the only two uh, FDA-approved medications for ALS treatment on the market right now. Um, in terms of... of um, Clinical trials, um, James, you may even know this better than I do. Um, I haven't seen anything new come down the pipe in my emails or, or threads lately um, in terms of molecules being under development. Um, but, again, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, say I agree with uh, I, I haven't seen a lot come by. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in terms of the, the two medications that you talked about, and I think that's, that's the whole deal about ALS. It's, it's different for everybody the way they accept it and the way they're going to do it. Absolutely. Now, to say, I want to extend my life by 90 days, what the thing to consider is those last 90 days mm -hmm. are probably the absolute worst yep. that you can do. And and so do you want to extend that part of it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it's either here or there. But I uh, I was just curious if, uh, if you had been – seen a spike either here here in the Payne County area or, or whatever. I know they they continue to have a lot of uh, uh, trying support for ALS, but uh, I, I was just curious if, if you had seen uh, what it what it was. Yeah, no, I, and I James, it's a really interesting question too because we're the longer that COVID is around, the more we're realizing the neurologic sequelae of this disease. Um, you know, when you look at things like um, I'll give you an example, post polio syndrome is something that I still see in the clinic. Uh, even now. So, you know, yeah. many, many years ago when polio was ravaging our, our planet, um, there were people that spent time in things like iron lungs. Uh, we vaccinated our population about, uh, against polio. And because of vaccination, and I'll say this again, because of vaccination, polio was basically eliminated from our human population. Now, when we look at things 40, 50, 60 years down the road, we're seeing these people with, with this entity called sure. post-polio syndrome which in many ways can look a lot like ALS. Uh, patients that come in with weaknesses in, in, in one limb or several limbs because of degeneration of the alpha motor neuron, the, the main neurons that, that uh, innervate muscle. So it's an interesting question that you pose because while we're not seeing a lot of, of ALS-like disease right now, um, I certainly hope we don't see it uh, in the near or long-term future as a result of, of our COVID pandemic? Well, I, I think you're right. I, uh, you know, as ALS, uh, people, when they find it or they have these symptoms, and, of course, for me in my situation, every time I hear somebody and they start talking about muscle loss or energy or, or, or caught, not, you know, they can't swallow and mm -hmm. that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I immediately think, have you been... If you had anybody check you, you know, for, for ALS, sure. it's just a natural thing for me to check. But sure. I think most people, when they get the diagnosis, uh, 
probably, you know, they go through that point of denial. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's the sad part for me is people just, they don't want to believe that this is going to happen, that the life expectancy all of a sudden has been given to you right. uh, much clearer than what it is. So mm-hmm. I, I hope that people will be brave enough to, okay, let's go out and find the help that we need because there is tremendous amount of help out there to make the life easier for people mm-hmm. and uh, uh, they don't have to go through it by themselves and have to struggle with all those things until they finally just give up and uh, I guess that's my term to just say okay uh, what do I got where do I have to go uh, the one final thing that I'd want to say is uh, I have heard and I, I don't know what legislatures are listening I, I hope certainly John Talley and some of the others are but uh, I've had a couple of people that are veterans that mm-hmm. say they have been having difficulty in getting VA support for ALS patients. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I don't know. I know we tried to get the protocol here in, in this deal and the COVID mm-hmm. set in, so I don't know what's right. going to happen for protocol there. But thank you for uh, uh, the calls. You, I think you've answered the questions that I want to have. And, uh, sure. Steve, thanks for letting me uh, take a little bit of time. To talk well, about you bet. Ago. Thanks for your your insight there. And yeah. I'm going to be talking to one of our representatives in the next hour. So I'll t- we'll have Senator okay. Bill Coleman on. So I'll mention uh, okay. what you had to say. Well, thank you. All right. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Hey, you too, James. There you go. Good call there. And you had some answers. Yeah. Wow. It's like <laughs> you did prep work for it. <laughs> uh, James's check is in the mail. There, there you go. So anything we missed, we covered a lot. It I, kept you a little longer than, so, than normal. So. Oh, no worries. No so, worries. I, we I can do we, this again if we, we want to. Do, we can do extra. Yeah, yeah. So just well, let me know. I, I'm, uh, I'm on vacation next week for most of the week, so maybe I'll just maybe See, I'll just stroll on over. I'm well, going to do a lot of one of those home vacations? Huh? Last time I went to a, we went to a, a thing sponsored by Simmons Bank. Uh-huh. I walk in, it's in the middle of the day, and there's John Wedlake, who's on vacation. <laughs> And so I share a table. You know, we sat together and had a nice meal together. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. And uh, he was on vacation and didn't have anything to do. So he just came, you know, <laughs> I, he got a free, some... I go on vacation, get a free lunch. There hey. you go. So <laughs> he was bored. So, uh, Amy, thanks for all you do. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Ashley, nice to meet you. Hi. And welcome to Stillwater. Yes, thank you. So, and uh, Counselor, Doctor, thanks for all you do. You I bet. appreciate it. Absolutely. So. Thanks, Steve.